Welcome back to the More God, Less Me podcast. I'm your host, Justin Lee, and this week we're going to talk about the peace that is to be found on the other side of suffering, something that I don't believe gets talked about enough, both the suffering and the peace that God will provide and that we can find on the other side of it. Suffering, struggle, hurt, challenge, and even persecution are all really things that we face as Christians, that we all face. It's not just that suffering is for some people and that blessings are for other people. We see within Scripture that the Bible says that we are all going to face various types of suffering, even though some groups nowadays want to claim that coming to faith in God will remove all such problems from your life, that you won't suffer, that you won't struggle, that you'll just live a blessed and happy life. And to just be completely frank right out of the gate, that's a complete lie from hell. That is, that is not the truth. Because that line of thinking and that mindset causes you to end up ultimately further away from God. When you begin to face the very aspects of the Christian life that are suffering, hardship, and peril, the ones that the Bible said would happen, the ones that God said in His Word would come for those who follow Him. I mean, just look at what it says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised by the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. We should not think it strange. We shouldn't be surprised. It shouldn't be some odd occurrence in our lives when we face persecution. Instead, we should expect it as we try to live righteous lives in a wicked and fallen world. And that's a truth that Jesus made a point of teaching. John chapter 15, verse 18 through 20 says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. The word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. So as Christians, we're going to struggle in this world simply because we serve God. We're going to face opposition. We're going to face trials. We're going to have tribulation in this world simply because of who we are as Christians. No matter what others want to teach, the simple truth is that becoming a Christian isn't guaranteed to solve every problem. And that's a truth that I believe that we can all testify to in our own lives. And that's why it's important right out the gate to cover that misconception about God because it will disconnect you from God. If you believe when you become a Christian that everything's going to get better, that you'll never face another day of struggle, another day of difficulty or trial in your life, and then you roll into the life that we just spoke about, that Jesus spoke about, that Peter wrote about, you're going to be disconnected from God. And so we need to get that mindset out that we think that after we become Christians, everything's going to be rainbows, sunshine, butterflies, and unicorns. That's not what the Bible promises. The Bible does promise to give us hope, but the Bible doesn't promise that it's going to be easy to be a Christian. In reality, coming to faith can introduce new and possibly even more problems than you've ever faced before, because now you stand in opposition to a sinful world and face an angry adversary, an adversary that you really didn't have before. Really, before you became a Christian, He was on your side and you were on his side because you were both sharing in wickedness and evil. But when you become a Christian, the devil begins to stand in strong opposition against you. And he's angry. And he wants nothing more than to see you to return to sin, to turn away from God, and to be back in his courts with him in the wicked world. That's what the devil wants. And so knowing that, we should be very aware that things aren't going to be super easy for us after our conversions. Now. All this is not to say that the Christian life is bleak. We shouldn't believe that either, because that's not the picture that the Bible paints. Our lives are not without hope, joy, peace, or love. They're not without just good times and happy lives, and often they're not without seasons of ease. In fact, the only way that you're ever going to experience true hope, true joy, true peace is through a right relationship with God. Really, you need the fruit of the Spirit to have those. We read in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So if we want to experience those things, we need God's Spirit in us. 
So even when we were in the world and we thought we had peace, we thought we had joy, the reason that we left the world is because we realized it was counterfeit, that those pleasures were fleeting. We come to God and we fully experience peace, joy. And having the fruit of the Spirit is part of what allows us to continue to experience those very things every day in our life, even when situations aren't the best. Let's also look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So if we want to experience peace, we simply need to go to God. We need to have that prayer life. I love this verse, honestly, and I've talked about it a lot on a lot of other podcast episodes. But we need to think about that, about not being anxious, but taking everything to God in prayer. That's an equation. Take everything to God in prayer. Make your request known to Him in thanksgiving. So prayer plus thankfulness. Prayer over what you're worried about plus thankfulness over all that you have equals God's peace that surpasses all understanding. That's an equation we should all be applying in our lives on a regular basis, and that's how we can have peace as Christians, no matter what we face, no matter what the enemy throws at us, no matter what the world throws at us, we can experience peace because we can take our worries, our anxieties, our fears to God, and we can go to Him with thanksgiving, knowing that He's already done so much for us, and we can be granted peace in every situation. Another verse that ties into this is Romans chapter 15 and 13. It says, May the God of hope, so God is a God of hope, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So God wants to give you hope, joy, and peace. May those things be active and true in your life, just as they were active and true in the lives of those that Paul was writing to. But our God is a God of hope, and may he fill us with joy and peace. And that's how we'll experience true joy and peace that aren't based on situations or anything like that, but are simply based on our right relationship with God. And it also doesn't mean that when you come to faith that certain problems in your life aren't solved, because there is a major problem that becoming a Christian solves. In fact, it solves the greatest problem that every human must face in life, that being death. Only God can solve death, and he did through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. God made a way that while we still will experience a physical death, we will wake up on the other side of eternity, and we won't be in the lake of fire, but we will be in heaven in God's glorious presence. As the redeemed children of God, we are blessed to be able to share in the great proclamation of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 through 55, which say, When the perishable puts on imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? That's something we can believe and trust in now. Death, where is your sting? I'm no longer afraid of you like I once was, because I have a blessed hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that my future and my salvation is sure. The most feared thing in this world is death, but our faith is able to erase that fear. We have the blessed hope and promise of eternal life. Really, death is the greatest adversary of the human race, and for us as the redeemed, those who have accepted salvation, those who have turned to God, who have turned to a a life of righteous living, that has been defeated. It's been defeated in our lives, and we no longer have to worry about it. This truth can drive us in our lives and give us the hope that we need when walking through difficult times. It can be this very knowledge and the relationship we have with God that makes the new challenges and struggles we face not affect us the way they would have before our conversion. Because now we have a firm foundation built upon God. So when the storm and the winds and the rain hit us, we don't fall, but we weather it securely, unafraid, unwavering. Because we have a blessed hope in God, we have these truths. I promise I'm getting to where we're going to talk about peace on the other side of suffering. But you have to understand, uh, first, how you can have peace in your suffering. And the way you can have peace in your suffering is by turning to God, trusting in God, trusting in His Word, and knowing that you have the blessed heaven. Knowing that something better lies ahead and that we don't have to walk this road alone 
or by our own strength, but are able to rely on God to meet our every need. We can find peace in the valley, as the song says, through our faith in God. And when we think about having peace in those difficult times, I don't think anybody stands out more in the Bible as an example of struggling in the Christian life after conversion, but remaining to have the peace, hope, and joy, and faith that we should all have as the Apostle Paul. A man who, in service to the Lord, probably faced more than any other Christian to ever follow after him. And it all came as a result of his service to the Lord. Because before his conversion to Christianity, he was a well-respected man. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was coming up in the, in the religion of the Jews. He didn't have the perils. He wasn't facing life in this way. He didn't, he didn't have the same struggles that he would have after his conversion. And even Paul was even favored enough that the Jewish high council chose him to be in charge of capturing and imprisoning Christians. Paul even describes in Galatians chapter 1 how he was advancing in the Jewish religion. In verse 14 it says, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. It's easy to see how Paul was living a good life and that it seemed like things were only going to get better for him. That he was going to climb the ladder of high religion in Israel. That he was going to be able to become maybe even, you know, somebody on the council or in that realm to where he would be respected. People would honor him in the streets. He wouldn't be hungry. He wouldn't be beaten. He would be wearing nice, clean clothing all the time. But that whole plan that Paul probably had in his mind, I imagine Paul was no different than we are. He was a very driven man, so we have to imagine maybe he was different than some of us are who aren't as driven. But he probably had a five, ten year plan of like what he wanted to accomplish in his life, where he wanted to go, and where he wanted to end up. But all of that changed for him on the road to Damascus when he had an encounter with the Lord. After that moment, his life was never the same. And it never would be the same again. He would become one of the loudest and most prolific voices the Christian faith has ever seen. I mean, there's not a better picture of a full 180 of a person like there is a Paul who hated Christians, who imprisoned Christians, and who was convinced that Jesus was not the Messiah. But then the road to Damascus and having an encounter with the Lord changed everything. And he became one of the most prolific missionaries or evangelists and writers of the New Testament that we have ever seen. I mean, Paul was unashamed of the faith, ready to share in season and out of season, and could not be silent. All things that he wrote, letters to other people, encouraging them to do the very same things, things that we should be doing. But those characteristics, while they're extremely righteous, and really how we should all be living in the faith, do not come without their share of persecution. Especially when you're unashamed, especially when you're ready to talk about something anytime, anywhere, any place, and when you cannot be silent, when you have those three characteristics and you're doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to be a very difficult life. And as such, Paul faced great persecution as a Christian. I mentioned it briefly earlier, but I want to bring it up here again because I, I'm amazed and almost, as weird as it sounds, I almost find it funny when people try to claim that living a Christian life is one of ease and worldly blessings, that that you'll give two hundred dollars or give two hundred dollars, get two thousand dollars, that you know you'll get every sickness you ever had will be healed if you just pray this prayer, all these things, or that you'll have mansions and you'll have this great life, and that the blessings of God are shown in the material. It's kind of insane, to be perfectly honest, because it doesn't match the Bible at all. You almost want to ask people that preach that or believe that message, have you read the Bible? Because if they have, then how can they make that claim as they see all the early church faced opposition and struggle? They had faith that exceeds ours by, you know, moves and bounds. I mean, they, they had so much more faith than we do, yet they were poor, beaten, imprisoned, hungry, and most of them were martyred. I mean, all but one of the apostles were martyred. They died for their faith, still never giving up their faith, still never denying Christ, but they all 
died for their faith. That's the exact opposite of the, the prosperity gospel. These men didn't live in mansions or wear the finest clothing. If any believers in history were going to be greatly blessed with worldly possessions, you would think it would have been those men who lived with Jesus and were taught by him firsthand. But then you have to remember that Jesus was a carpenter's son, that Jesus said, I don't have a home. Foxes have dens, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. Jesus traveled to and fro. He, never, he didn't hardly have any of his own possessions. So we have to realize that if God in the flesh comes to our world and he doesn't live a life, of material blessings, and all the apostles after him didn't live a life of ease and material blessings, we're probably not going to live it either. And the, the truth of the matter is, is that God's favor can be seen in blessings. God can bless you financially. God can heal you of your ailment. God can do all those things, and I believe that in many cases he does those things to help his people. But he doesn't give us so much more than we need. He doesn't have a store up in barns for ourselves behind us. There's a whole parable about a man who had so much crops and he filled up his barns and he still had stuff to store. What's he do? He tears them down and then builds bigger barns and stores that and the next day he dies. God teaches us a lesson about having more than we need and so God's not going to give us so much more than we need. God's going to give you exactly what you need, when you need it, and how you need it. But beyond that, the real blessings of God, the ones that the great men of faith in our Bible, the ones who started the church after Jesus' ascension into heaven, the real blessings that they experienced were not physical or material. They were spiritual blessings. Those are the real true blessings of God. They're what empowered men like Paul to walk through all the struggle they faced with peace, joy, and hope. God never promised them or us that the road would be easy, but always provided what they needed to be overcomers, just like he'll always provide us with what we need to overcome this world. Paul's suffering was spoken of by God to Ananias before he had even fully converted. We read in Acts chapter 19, verses 15 and 16, and again, this is, written, this is God speaking to Ananias, who would go to Paul and help him in his conversion. He would pray for Paul. Paul would get his sight back, and Paul would be baptized, and all those things. But this is right before that. It says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. That's a pretty hard word, and it was probably one that, that Ananias was like, This guy's going to have to really face some stuff, but I still doubt that Ananias would have understood everything Paul would end up facing in that moment. You know, because most of us as Christians can think of at least one season or time of difficulty as we've walked through the faith. But Paul, it's different. It's not just one time, a few times. His list is almost unending. In fact, I imagine we don't even know the half of what Paul faced based on just the little bit of information that we have. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul takes a moment to list much of what he faced in service to the Lord. And he says in... Uh, Verses 23 through 27. I want to be able to give you guys the thing. So it's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 27. It says, Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Now that is a difficult life. That's a life of hardship in service to God. That's a life that you could complain about. Paul doesn't complain about it. Paul is happy to share in the sufferings of the Lord. But if anybody could have complained, it would have been Paul. You could say he lived a dangerous life, a hard life, a life that none of us would want to live or experience. And I have to imagine that Paul got to a place in the faith where he believed this would just be his lot in life. And I don't say that to mean he was discouraged or that he was lacking faith. His own writings prove that that wasn't the case. 
Through all he faced, he continued to spread the gospel everywhere he went and to write messages of hope and encouragement to various churches, such as Romans 8.28, where he says, And we know for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. What a statement for a man who just said all those things that he faced in service to God. But then like, in like manner, we have Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 1 Thessalonians 4.13-18 through 18 says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. Asleep here means dead. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven, and with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the, in the dead Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's where we can really see Paul's mindset. Paul says, I don't want you to be sorrowful about those who have passed away. And I want you to encourage each other that we're all going to get to see God, that we're all going to get to inherit heaven, that we're all headed for blessing. And these are just a few of the encouraging verses that Paul penned. I could have listed more than we have time to even talk about in this podcast today because so much of what Paul said was encouragement to other believers, even while he himself was facing such difficult and trying times. Clearly, he was not lacking in the faith department. But I do believe he came over time to believe that for him, living for God meant facing endless obstacles and persecution until he passed from this life to the next. Because that's all he had experienced up until this point as a believer. The first time he began to preach, he had to flee the town for fear of the Jews, and the same thing happened in pretty much every city that he ever took the gospel to. Simply put, Paul lived a rough and difficult life after his conversion, much more difficult physically and to the world's eyes than he would have ever faced had he never converted. But despite it all, Paul was happy to serve God in that capacity. He had a faith that outweighed all these things and knew it was worth facing these temporary challenges to help others share an eternal salvation, because that was his heart's desire. You can see that in Paul's writings. All he wanted was for everyone to become like him, except for the perils he was facing in the faith. He wanted everybody to come to life-saving faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul wanted. Paul was ready and willing to face continual hindrances and sufferings as he did the work of God until the Lord chose to take him home. But God had another plan, one that I imagine Paul never saw coming. Because as Paul is facing all these things, God's working in the background and orchestrating a time of peace for Paul after his season of suffering. The Lord set Paul up to experience a two-year break from opposition in the most unlikely of places. We know this as the last two verses of Acts leave us by saying, it's Acts 28, uh, chapter 28, verses 30 through 31, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So for the space of two years, Paul was able to live and share the gospel message without anyone, or with anyone, sorry, willing to come to him without hindrance. From a time of his conversion, all Paul wanted to do was just this. He just wanted to tell people about Christ. But in doing so, he constantly faced opposition. He was constantly being attacked, chased, beaten, imprisoned, whatever they could do in an attempt to try to silence the man. They tried it. But now, years later, Paul's able to do exactly as his heart desires without being fought again. And in all places, Rome. The heart of the pagan world in this time and right under the nose of wicked Nero, who despised Christians and would some years later be the one to order Paul's own execution, an act that would, to the world, sounds like the worst punishment 
of imaginable. But to Paul, it was actually the way that he received his greatest reward because it meant he was finally free from the bonds of this life and could have his heart's truest desire, a desire that he shares in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. He says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Paul looked at death as the far better option compared to living. And obviously he would, because he had extreme faith in God, and he was facing circumstances that we don't have to face today, circumstances that we can hardly imagine, things that make our situations as difficult as they are, and I'm not talking down to your situation, but you have to think about where Paul was. He was facing things that make our situations look small, minuscule, insignificant. And so compared to what he faced, he said, I would rather die and be with God because that's the better option. And it truly, honestly, is the better option. The better place to be is heaven. And like Paul, we have to wait until God chooses our time to go. We can't advance God's timeline and we can't stop God's purpose for using us. But we can look forward to the day that we graduate from this life and enter the next. And that's exactly what Paul was doing. Paul didn't wish to die. Paul still wanted to serve as many people as he could because he realized that was better for others. But he did long to finally be with the Lord, his God. If only we all had the faith of Paul and could share his righteous view of death, then we would not have only hope for a time of peace in this life, but would be able to look forward to the time of peace that awaits every believer, one that will never end or last only a few years. The time of peace that God has prepared for us all will stretch through eternity, a timeline that we cannot even begin to imagine. Because we're going to fully experience the promise of Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, where it says, He will wipe away every tear from the eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, nor any more, for the former things have passed away. That's the blessed hope that we have in heaven. That's what we should be looking forward to, a time of true, lasting peace. I pray that we all get to experience seasons of peace in this life. But in the seasons that aren't peaceful, may we look forward to the blessed hope we have in heaven. Now, turning back to Paul's two years in Rome, what a blessing in a time of recharge that must have been for him. Because finally he's able to preach the gospel day in and day out with those who needed to hear it and not face any kind of opposition. While he was not free in body, the Bible clearly states that he was in house arrest. But he was free to peacefully minister to anyone willing to listen. And it seems as though many came to listen and that he was able to write many letters of follow-up and encouragement to the churches in that time. And for those short few years, he didn't have to worry about attack or even the slightest opposition. I mean, for two years, no one tried to stop him from telling others about the Lord, something he had not really experienced the entire time that he had been a Christian. That's amazing. I believe that that was a massive change of pace and, and something that he couldn't have imagined to see coming, but it was something that he needed. And I believe that this shows the mercy and the love that God has for his people. Because persecution, struggle, adversity are all going to come as a part of living the redeemed life for God. That much is clear. We've talked about it already. But another truth has to be coupled with that. And that's that God's will, or God will not give you more than you can bear, more than you can carry or handle. God will give you peace on the other sides of suffering. And often it may not come in ways that you would have ever expected. Just like we see here in the life of Paul. In Paul's case, it seems like God put him in house arrest just so that he could get the break that he needed. We know that it was God's plan for Paul to speak before the Roman emperor because in Acts chapter 23, verse 11, it says, The following night the Lord stood by him, that's Paul, and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So, God's plan was for Paul to end up in Rome. But Paul would never have stopped on his own. Paul would have never taken that break on his own. 
And as long as he was free, he was going to keep working and keep pushing because he had a great amount of dedication to his God-given calling. And that's one thing that we should all try to do our best at and try to imitate Paul in is being dedicated to the call that God has put on our lives. Paul's a great example of being purposeful in the faith and doing the Lord's work to the best of your abilities. But the simple truth is that even the best of people, like Paul, need a break from time to time. And because of the love that God has for us, he's going to allow for breaks in the midst of our suffering. God's not just going to force us to suffer forever. God's not just going to send us in these seasons of sadness and sorrow and difficulty without any hope of a better day or a better tomorrow. Because God loves us. God's going to give us times where we can recharge and get the break that we need. In cases like Paul's even, when we don't know we need the break or wouldn't stop on our own. In other cases, it may seem like the break's never going to come. You may be wanting and desiring after that break, and it seems like it simply won't come or that it's not ever going to happen for you. But the important thing to remember is that God has perfect timing, and that timing isn't always going to match our hopes or expectations. But one thing is for sure, when God gives you a time of peace, it's going to come exactly when, where, and how you need it so that it will be the most effective in your life. God's not going to give you time of peace that you don't actually need. God's not going to give it to you in a way that you don't need. God's not going to come in before you need his assistance. God knows exactly what you need. And so if you're not finding that time of peace yet, there's still something for you in the time that you're in, in the season that you're facing. It may not be the rest that you would have chosen, but if God is providing it, you can trust that it's exactly what you need. Know that God's love for you is sure, and that you can see it in the scripture. Possibly the most well-known Bible verse, John 3.16, makes this abundantly clear. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God so loves the world. That's an impressive statement. And if God loves us so much that he made this way for us to be saved, even while we were yet sinners and made it so that we could have peace in heaven, why do we struggle to believe that he will provide us a season of peace in this life? Why do we believe that God wouldn't do that for us now, even though he's prepared a place for us in the future of peace, and he doesn't want us to suffer for all time, and he loved us so much that he robed himself in flesh, that he came down, and that he suffered in ways that he would never have had to suffer as God, simply to make a better option for us as his people. God loves you. God cares about you. And as such, God's going to give you peace. And how can we question when we look at the lives of biblical figures like Paul, who God did just that for, who God provided peace for in their time of need, provided a relief, met them. I talked about um, Elijah a while back and how God moved in his life and gave him Elisha to cast his mantle on to be that like figure of faith that encouraged him in the way he needed encouragement in the moment. God's going to move in your situation in the way that you need it. God's going to give you exactly what you need, lead you into the places. And, and of all people, Elijah was led, you know, he was led to the, the brook and the ravens brought him food. That was God's provision. And then he was led to the widow woman. And not only did God continue to nourish Elijah, through the meal and through the oil to make the cakes. But it also, Elijah's willingness ended up feeding that woman and her child. There's so much that God did in that moment in delivering and giving Elijah exactly what he needed. And we see how God gave Paul exactly what he needed. We can believe that God's going to do the same for us because God is no respecter of person. And that means that he's, what he's done for others, even someone like Paul or Elijah, He's willing to do the same for all of us. God doesn't look at one person as better than the other simply by who they are. We are all eligible for the same blessings, the same love, the same kindness of God. You may be going through some difficulties right now, and it may seem as though that's all God has for you. But I want you to know that God has a time of peace waiting for you on the other side of your struggle. At some time, God's going to release that. God's going to lead you in to that season. And you may not be able to see it coming now, but God has it. God isn't going to give you more than you were able to handle through his strength. God's with you, walking with you, helping you, and he's not going to break you. He's not going to push you too far, but he is going to allow you to experience what you need to experience in this life 
to better yourself, to grow closer to him. There's things that we can only build as Christians in those times. It's the fires that try us like they try gold. It's what makes us the strong that we are. It's what strengthens us as Christians. It draws us closer to God and teaches, him to, teaches us to rely on him in ways that we couldn't learn during a time of peace or a time of ease. That's why God allows these things. It's for our betterment and for our blessed hope. And so we don't end up trusting in ourselves above him, but continue to rely on him and continue to trust in our salvation. That's what we need to understand. And as you're walking through your struggle, share in the blessed hope that Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. How did Paul face everything he did? Because he did it with hope in life. He trusted in a biblical eternity and the peace he would experience in heaven, how it would be so much better than any peace he could have experienced on earth. He says, think about what he says there. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed to us. We're going to experience such great things that while, yes, we're suffering now, these sufferings are nothing compared to how great the things are that we're going to experience in heaven. But he, And still, he didn't expect a time of peace. But God still provided one for him. Paul's faith in God and the promise of eternal life helped him to face all manner of suffering without wavering because he knew that those things could not compare to what awaited for him. That's a hope and faith that we should all share. You may struggle to see how a time of peace could be coming for you on the other side of suffering in this life, even though God could have great plans for you. But definitely don't fail to find your hope and strength in the fact that peace awaits us not just on the other season and side of our suffering, but on the other side of the whole sufferings of this life. No matter your situation, struggle, the challenges you are currently facing, you must know that as a redeemed child of God, you have the promise of a better future. We will still experience death, but it will not be the end. On the other side, we will be ushered into the presence of God and into the glory of heaven. Where, as we have already talked about, there will be no more pain, sorrow, or suffering. But we'll be blessed to live in peace for all time. When those days come, these times will be nothing more than a distant memory, a small blip on the scales of eternity. Because of your salvation, all hope is yours for a better tomorrow. But this life will not always be perfect, and we must realize that seasons of life change. And so, and we need to know that so that we are not discouraged by all that we face. Remember what Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says. We start at verse 1 and just read verse 1 and 2. It says, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planting. Suffering will come, but it will not last forever. Peace will come and take its place. But we must understand that the time of peace is also a season, and it too will come to an end. In Paul's case, his time of peace lasted two years, and then he was released from his house imprisonment. His house arrest is a better way to say that, probably. He was released from his house arrest and went straight back into the missions field with seemingly no hesitation. That's nothing worth pausing on for a moment because at this point, Paul could have chose a simpler life. He could have rented another house and continued entertaining guests and sharing the gospel as he had been for the last two years, but that wasn't what Paul felt called to do. And I believe that comfort called to him like it does to all of us. I don't believe that Paul was immune to our desires to relax, to lounge to live in luxury and peace and ease. I don't think that Paul was different from us in those ways. He still had flesh. He was still human. But he was willing to give all that up, to put all those desires aside, knowing, again, what lied for him. He knew that the future was eternity of that relaxation, of that peace, of that ease of life. And so he was willing to give up the momentary versions of that in this world and continue to do what God had called him to do. And so after his season of peace, he returned to the same suffering that he had for a time been freed from. And that ultimately led to him losing his life, but gaining his ultimate reward, as we covered earlier. That's not, that's, that was not a sad day 
for the well-weathered apostle, but one of joy, praise, celebration, and I imagine ultimate peace because he stepped onto the other side of victory. He was a victorious man in the faith. I bring all this up to make the point that seasons will come and seasons will go. Life is going to change on you, and you will experience some times of peace, joy, hope, and ease. But there will be times that you experience sorrow, pain, suffering, and hardship. That's the simple truth of life in a fallen world. But praise God, bad seasons will not last forever. They will come, and they will go, and they will possibly even come again. But in the end of time, when we are blessed to enter the pearly gates of heaven, the season of love, joy, hope, and peace that we find will never end, but will last forever. Take that with you. That's something to look forward to with exceedingly great joy. No matter the season of life that you are in right now, you can find joy in knowing that you will experience a time that will never change. In heaven, there are no seasons. There are no casting shadows, no shifting lights. Time does not change in heaven. But you will experience the same season that you walk into in love, hope, joy, and peace where sorrow has been wiped away will be the one you experience throughout all your time in heaven. Praise God for that truth. And find your hope in it. I truly believe everything that we've talked about in this podcast episode today. I believe that God gives us times of peace in this life. And Paul was a strong man. And from what we see in Scripture, he had one time of peace before entering his eternal time of peace. That's after his salvation, of course. Our lives may look different than that. We may have longer seasons of peace and shorter seasons of trouble, but we are all going to suffer. And we need to know that a better time is coming, that there are seasons that God will blow in something different and we'll be able to experience peace in this life but that there's a greater promise of peace on the other side. And so any time that we're suffering, any time we're struggling, we need to remember the blessed promises of God and be sure to take that other writing from Paul, from Philippians, to not be anxious, not be worried, not be concerned about anything in this life, but to take all things to God in prayer with thanksgiving so you can experience peace without understanding because it will fill your hearts when you do that. I want to become such an advocate of that verse and people putting that equation to work in their life because of how I've experienced it worked in my life. And we know that it must have worked in Paul's life based on all that he faced, yet he was never anxious or worried. He simply kept trusting God through it all. That's an amazing testimony. And may we share in that same testimony, but it's going to take dedication. It's going to take decisions to pray, decisions to seek after God in difficult times, and to continue trusting God even when it's not easy. But we need to know that God has a plan and a purpose, and that bad times aren't a sign that God doesn't love us. Bad times are a sign of living in a fallen world. But all the good things that we have are a sign of God's love, because all good and perfect things come from God. So I hope that you'll take this all to heart. I pray that this podcast has been a blessing to you. I pray that as you walk into suffering and as you walk into seasons of suffering, that you'll remember these words, that a time of peace is coming for you and that a better time of peace is coming for you on the other side of eternity that will never change. That's the blessed hope and the blessed promise we have. We can face all things in this life knowing that this is a blip and that we will experience true peace, true joy, and true Eve for all eternity. I hope that this has helped those of you who are currently struggling and that it's prepared those of you who are currently living in peace for when the seasons change. All thanks be to God that we can find such blessed truth and His inspired word that we don't have to go far, that we don't have to search hard for it, but all we have to do is open the pages of the Bible. And in today's society, all we have to do is Google, what does the Bible say about hope? What does the Bible say about peace? What does the Bible say about heaven? And we can find the great promises of Scripture right when we need them, anywhere we are in our connected society. Let's use those tools for good and not for evil. But when we're struggling, let us turn to our phones to find verses of encouragement by simply Google searching the information. that we Maybe that's how you got here. But continue to do that and find your hope, find your peace, find your joy wherever. It is. Again, I hope that this podcast 
has helped you in some way. I hope that it's provided you a truce to help you navigate certain situations in this life. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. We're putting out new content every week, all focused on getting you to have more of God and less of yourself. And if any person fits that description, it would be Paul. Paul had so much of God and so little of himself. And may we strive to be like that in our lives. May he increase and may we decrease, as John the Baptist said. I hope that you'll help us by sharing this podcast on social media. I pray that you'll like, comment, rate, subscribe, whatever it is on the platform that you're on that you can do to help us reach a broader audience. We truly appreciate it. The best way that we have to reach this world is through you helping our content by liking it, by rating, commenting, those things like that. They push things forward and they allow us to reach new demographics, new audience, And that's what we really want to do is just reach people with hope-filled messages like this, with messages of encouragement and inspiration to help people live the best life for God that they can live. And we can't do that on our own. We need your help to reach as many people as possible. Again, I hope this podcast has blessed you. I thank you if you're one of those people willing to help us share this message through all those different forms. Thank you so much for what you're doing for us and for the kingdom. I believe that this podcast can touch souls, can touch lives. And by sharing it, you're helping us to do just that. And you're making an impact in this world. It's the ripple effect. You don't know what you're going to do, but you could cause great things to happen just by one simple click of the button nowadays. That's how our world works. Um, but that's all that we have for you today in this episode. I just want you to remember that there's peace waiting for you, both in this life and in the next life. What a great hope that we have in God. I'll be back with you on Wednesday for the God Notes podcast and then back on Friday to do the Better Together podcast with my wife. And until we talk to you again, I hope you have a great rest of your week and God bless. God bless.